I'm Jennifer Waters, the director of the Nikon Imaging Center at Harvard Medical School and a Chan Zuckerberg Initiative imaging scientist. This microcourse is on spherical aberration. Throughout this video, I'm going to assume that you already have a good understanding of the point spread function. So if you need to, please stop now and watch the point spread function microcourse first. I'll start with a definition of the word aberration. An aberration is a distortion in the image, with that distortion being generated by the optical system. Spherical aberration is one of several types of aberrations that can be found in microscopy images. Spherical aberration is common, difficult to avoid, and imposes limitations on image quality. I'm going to go over several sources of spherical aberration, but I think it's helpful to start with the phenotype, what spherical aberration looks like and what it does to your images. Ideally, a lens is able to focus light into a single focal plane. When spherical aberration is present, light comes into focus at different planes, resulting in what is referred to as the circle of confusion. In an ideal lens, light maintains a spherical shape as it comes in and out of focus, Spherical aberration results in a deviation from the spherical shape, hence the name spherical aberration. A three-dimensional volume of images of a point source of light, here we're looking at an axial view, reveals the point spread function of the microscope and any aberrations that might be present. Spherical aberration distorts the point spread function away from the ideal in three ways. First, that circle of confusion means that the central maxima of the point spread function is spread out in space. Spherical aberration also shifts the focus image into a different plane. And while an ideal point spread function is symmetrical, spherical aberration results in an asymmetrical point spread function. Collecting a three-dimensional volume of a point source isn't necessary to identify spherical aberration in an image. Spherical aberration can also be identified by focusing up and down on a point source in your specimen. When looking at the lateral image of a point source through the eyepieces or projected onto a camera and focusing first in one direction and then in the other, an ideal point spread function will appear symmetrical in both directions. If spherical aberration is present, the asymmetry of the point spread function will be evident. So what does spherical aberration do to your imaging data? As you might imagine, it's not good news. Spherical aberration decreases both lateral and axial resolution. As I discussed in the point spread function microcourse, resolution is determined by the size of the point spread function central maxima. Spherical aberration makes the central maxima bigger in both the lateral and axial directions relative to the ideal. Spherical aberration therefore prevents your microscope from reaching its theoretical resolution limit. To make matters worse, spherical aberration decreases the intensity of the image. This is also a direct result of the central maxima being spread out in space. So if we look at a lateral image of these point spread functions and heat map pseudocolor it for intensity, we can see that spherical aberration decreases the intensity of the image of that point source. And so the presence of spherical aberration may compromise the accuracy of some intensity measurements. I'll say more about that later. But even if you're not making intensity measurements and your experiment doesn't require obtaining maximum resolution, spherical aberration just makes images look bad. And it's not always obvious that image quality is suffering from spherical aberration until you've made the effort to look for it and reduce it. I wanna emphasize that these are both wide field fluorescence images. I haven't switched to a confocal or done super resolution microscopy to get better image quality. All I've done is reduce spherical aberration in the image. And I'm gonna go over some of the ways to reduce spherical aberration, but first, let's discuss some of the common causes of spherical aberration. First, spherical aberration may be inherent to the image forming optics. A perfect lens would focus each ray of light into the exact same point, resulting in a perfect point spread function. Unfortunately, such a perfect lens exists only in theory. 
In reality, light passing through different regions of a simple lens, from the center to the periphery, come into focus at different planes, resulting in spherical aberration. A first step to avoiding spherical aberration is to use an objective lens that has been well corrected. Objective lenses are more than just simple lenses. They actually contain many lens elements, in part to correct for aberrations. In their highest quality objective lenses, manufacturers go to great lengths to correct as much as possible for spherical aberration. The major manufacturers of high-end optical microscopes usually mark their objective lenses with a phrase that indicates the extent of aberration correction. Objective lenses marked plan apo or plan floor are usually well corrected for spherical aberration in the most commonly used wavelengths of visible light. Note that correction for aberrations in a given objective lens can only be optimized for a limited range of wavelengths. Information on the extent to which a particular lens is corrected for spherical aberration can be found on the manufacturer's website. However, there's only so much microscope manufacturers can do because there are other sources of spherical aberration, including your specimen. When thinking about the performance of an objective lens, it's important to recognize that the optical engineer who designed it had to make some assumptions about how you would use it. Most often, objective lenses are designed assuming you'll image a thin specimen attached directly to a cover slip that is a specific thickness using the manufacturer's immersion media. If you deviate from any of these assumptions, you should expect a decrease in performance of the lens. Recall that refraction can occur when light traveling through a medium enters a different medium. The refractive index of a medium is determined by the speed at which light travels through it relative to the speed of light in a vacuum. When light hits perpendicular to the interface between media with different refractive indices, the light travels straight through. However, when light approaches the interface at an angle, refraction occurs, resulting in a change in the direction in which the light propagates. Schnell's law gives us the change in the angle of propagation we can expect given the refractive index of the media. When designing a lens, the manufacturer knows the refractive index of their immersion media and the refractive index of the recommended cover slips, so they know whether to expect refraction at these interfaces. But they don't know the refractive index of your specimen, which likely has a range of refractive indices present throughout the specimen, and therein lies the problem. Spherical aberration occurs when there is a mismatch in refractive index between the specimen and the lens immersion media. For example, in the very common scenario of imaging live biological samples with an oil immersion lens. In this case, the immersion oil refractive index is matched to the refractive index of the cover slip, but the specimen has a different, often lower, refractive index. Now, this is not meant to discourage you from using an oil immersion lens to image biological specimens. High numerical aperture oil immersion lenses are often the best choice. However, it's also important to recognize that even the best choices in life come with limitations and compromises. So why does a mismatch in refractive index between the specimen and the lens immersion media result in spherical aberration? Let's walk through it step by step. First, we need to orient ourselves in the microscope. Looking at the critical components in the optical path for this discussion, we have our specimen, which in this example, we've placed on or beneath a cover slip. We have optics, including the objective lens, that collect light from the specimen and form an image at what we call the image plane. The optics are positioned such that the image of the specimen comes into focus on the detector that is used to capture the image, such as a camera. We need to compare the light as it's coming from the specimen to the light as it's being focused into an image of the specimen. For clarity, I've pseudocolored the light yellow as it leaves the specimen on its way to the objective lens, and then later in the optical path, pink, as it forms an image of the specimen at the image plane. Appreciate that light leaving the specimen passes through various materials on its way to being focused on the image plane and these materials have different refractive indices. The immersion oil and cover slip have similar refractive index, but the air in the microscope has a different refractive index, and in most cases, the specimen has still another refractive index. 
Now let's compare the light coming from the specimen to light as it forms the image. We can appreciate this phenomenon by just looking at a few light rays at different angles. We'll start at the specimen. For this example, let's say our biological specimen is an object of interest surrounded by an aqueous solution. If the object was mounted right smack up against the cover slip, such that the light leaving the specimen passes directly into the cover slip and immersion media, then, later on in the optical path, as the light is traveling through air to form the image, it would, assuming the optics were perfectly corrected for spherical aberration, come into a focus point at a single plane. Just what we want. However, most of what we want to image is not going to be sitting smack up against the cover slip, but instead will be some distance from the cover slip, surrounded by the aqueous solution. The light coming from the object now experiences a change in refractive index as it travels from the aqueous solution into the cover slip. So, when our object of interest resides any non-zero distance from the cover slip, refraction will occur at the interface between the aqueous solution and the cover slip. Moving back up to the image plane, the light travels through air on its way to focusing into an image. There's no refractive index change on this end, so the light rays will travel straight to form the image. The result is spherical aberration. This can be a bit tricky to get your head around, so let's look at this one more time, but this time we'll overlay the rays leaving the specimen with the rays as they form the image of the specimen. Light traveling from the object refracts at the interface between the aqueous solution and the cover slip. Later in the microscope, the light travels straight through air to form the image. Refraction that occurred at the specimen results in the light rays coming to focus at different planes. We can see that the image of the point has an elongated maxima, is asymmetrical, and is shifted in focus relative to the position of the object. In other words, our specimen has induced spherical aberration. I'm afraid that's not the end of this sad story, because as the distance between an object and the cover slip increases, so does spherical aberration. Therefore, objects that reside at different depths within the same sample will have varying amounts of spherical aberration. Spherical aberration therefore introduces error into intensity measurements of objects residing at varying distances from the cover slip. This may cause significant problems, particularly when quantifying intensity in three-dimensional specimens. For example, in a 2006 methods paper, Jokel Carr et al. looked at the intensity of kinetochores in yeast cells to determine the amount of error spherical aberration was contributing to their measurements. As expected from our understanding of spherical aberration, they found that the intensity of kinetochores decreased as they focused deeper into the specimen. In this case, their intensity dropped almost 30%, only microns under the cover slip. I do want to emphasize that this is just an example. The decrease in intensity you might see could be lower or higher, as it depends on the optical setup and the specimen. Now, tolerance for error does depend on what you're trying to measure. A decrease in intensity at the scale of this example may not matter at all if you're looking to measure several fold increase in intensity. But if you're trying to measure small changes in intensity in objects residing at different focal planes, ignoring this error could lead you to incorrect conclusions. Now let's move on to some of the ways that you can reduce spherical aberration in images of your specimens. However, as you'll come to see, there are only partial solutions. In practice, it's nearly impossible to eliminate spherical aberration from images of typical biological samples collected with an optical microscope. Some of the solutions I'll go over are easy wins, so easy you should begin implementing them right away. Others are hard-fought victories that may be worth the hassle if the presence of spherical aberration affects your measurements and the conclusions you would like to draw from them. One of the easiest things you can do is to make sure that you're using the right cover slips, meaning the type of cover slips the optical engineer who designed the lens assumed you would use. Most objective lenses were designed to image through a cover slip of a particular thickness, and that thickness is marked on the barrel of the objective in millimeters. 
you'll most often see 0.17 millimeters, which corresponds to a cover slip that's been graded as a number 1.5. You can find the grade number on the box of cover slips. Next, try to get your object of interest as close as possible to the cover slip. Remember that spherical aberration increases as you focus farther away from the cover slip. You should therefore make every effort to mount your specimen as close as possible to the cover slip. And when I say close, I mean every micron counts. When imaging live cells in cover slip bottom dishes, grow the cells as close as possible to the glass surface. If your specimen requires, for example, a gel matrix, the image quality will be far better if the cells are attached to the cover slip with the gel on top versus growing the cells on top of the gel. When working with larger specimens, try to mount them so the area you're interested in is closest to the cover slip. Or you might be able to cut or section your large specimen to get the area of interest close to the cover slip. If you're working with a sample that absolutely cannot be placed directly onto the cover slip, you'll most likely need to accept lower image quality as a compromise. It's okay to make compromises as long as you know you're making them and you limit your conclusions accordingly. Another easy win is to check the refractive index of your mounting media. As we've discussed, spherical aberration occurs when there is a mismatch in refractive index between the specimen and the lens immersion media. So spherical aberration can be reduced by matching the refractive index of the specimen to the immersion media. Now, this is tough, if not impossible, to do with live specimens, but when using an immersion oil lens to image fixed specimens, you can use a mounting media with a refractive index close to that of immersion oil. See the description box below the video for examples of mounting medias that are designed to achieve a refractive index similar to that of immersion oil. And my last suggestion for an easy win, the manufacturers of objective lenses provide you with another option for spherical aberration correction, correction collars. If your objective lens has a correction collar, you must use it. Not every lens has one, but if your lens does, it's because the optical engineer who designed the lens knew it was necessary for that particular lens to perform optimally under different conditions. When correction collars are rotated, elements within the lens move to correct for spherical aberration. Often correction collars are labeled for things like temperature or cover slip thickness, but the purpose of the correction collar is always to correct for spherical aberration. Since many things can affect spherical aberration, it's best to adjust the collars empirically rather than relying on the markings on the objective. To adjust a collar to the optimal position, you should plan to take your time the process can be a bit finicky. First, focus on a tiny point source in your specimen. Then, reaching under the stage if you're on an inverted microscope, rotate the collar a small amount. Moving the collar will change focus in addition to modifying the point spread function, so you'll need to focus on the point source again. Next, check for symmetry and intensity of the point spread function and repeat until you're satisfied. As a reminder, you can check for symmetry of the point spread function by focusing up and down on the point source. It is well worth taking the time to figure out the position of the collar that maximally reduces spherical aberration in images of your particular specimen. That is exactly what I did to reduce spherical aberration in this example. Now we'll move on to solutions that are hard fought victories that may be worth the hassle. Another approach to dealing with spherical aberration that's provided by microscope manufacturers are objective lenses that are designed to work with a cover slip and an immersion media with a refractive index lower than immersion oil. Lenses that are designed to be used with water, silicone, or glycerol as the immersion medium can be used to reduce spherical aberration when imaging specimens with a similar refractive index to the immersion medium. By matching the refractive index of the sample and the immersion medium, light will refract when it hits the cover slip, but then refract back equal and opposite when it enters the immersion medium. 
But a warning, these lenses can introduce additional aberrations. Check the reference list in the description box below the video. And a final suggestion for reducing spherical aberration is known as immersion oil refractive index matching. The refractive index of the immersion oil affects spherical aberration. While oil immersion objectives are designed to be used with the manufacturer's immersion oil, using a different immersion oil with a slightly different refractive index can be used to reduce spherical aberration. A manuscript that thoroughly describes this approach is provided in the description box below the video. We've gone over multiple approaches to correcting spherical aberration in your images, but they are all only partial solutions. Why partial? We've learned that spherical aberration changes with depth from the cover slip. Since the angle of refraction changes with wavelength, spherical aberration is also wavelength dependent. So while correcting for spherical aberration using one or more of these methods can be very useful for some experiments, the unfortunate reality is that spherical aberration can only be maximally reduced for one wavelength over a small range of focal depths. This is true for all of the methods described here. To demonstrate, let's look at using immersion oil refractive index matching to optimize the point spread function. To see the effect of wavelength, we'll look at point spread functions collected using fluorescent beads that are infused with a green fluorophore and a red fluorophore. This is the point spread function of the green fluorescence. It was collected after using immersion oil refractive index matching to minimize spherical aberration. If we now switch filter sets and look at the red fluorescence of the same bead, we can see that there is spherical aberration in this channel. If we then change immersion oils to one with a refractive index that optimizes the red point spread function, the green is no longer optimized. Super annoying. To see the effect of depth, we can look at images of a bunch of fluorescent beads embedded in a thick slab of agarose. Immersion oil refractive index matching was used to correct spherical aberration at a particular depth. But you can see that above and below that range, spherical aberration remains. I know, lots of bad news in this microcourse, but it's important to recognize the limitations that spherical aberration imposes on achievable image quality and the accuracy of quantitative microscopy and to design your experiments with these limitations in mind.